reforming the church. Analysis from Rome after Pope Francis announces his long-awaited changes to the Holy See's administration. Call for peace, what Ukraine's president said in a phone conversation with the Holy Father. Huddle with NATO. President Biden is set to visit allies in Europe. We have a preview from the White House. And planning for Easter. Why the Vatican's schedule for Holy Week will look a little different from the past two years. On EWTN News Nightly for Tuesday, March 22nd, 2022. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. Reaction continues to pour in after the Holy Father released his reforms for the Vatican's bureaucracy. The document brings changes to the structure of the administration at the Holy See, known as the Roman Curia. Among the biggest moves, any Catholic layperson, man or woman, can now head a Vatican office. The reforms are set to take effect on June 5th, the Solemnity of Pentecost. Joining us now from Rome is Andreas Tonhauser, EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief. Andreas, thanks so much for joining us. Great to see you. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the document and why it was released now? Thank you, Tracy. Well, many were surprised here in Rome when the Vatican presented the new apostolic constitution last weekend without any prior notice, and at first only in Italian. This document has been in the making for years, and its final publication coincides with the ninth anniversary of Pope Francis's inauguration. It replaces the previous pastor bonus, the constitution which has been in place since 1988 and adapted by Pope Benedict XVI and then Pope Francis himself. This document will affect the church not only here in Rome, but around the world. That is why there was a big surprise that there has been no information ahead of the publishing. Yesterday, on Monday, there was a virtual press conference presenting the document to the public. And, and what are some of the specific changes, Andreas, and how will they affect the Catholic Church and its estimated 1.2 billion faithful? Well, I would say there are three main things. Um, the role of laypersons in church leadership, the focus on local bishops' conferences, and the emphasis on evangelization. Now, let me start with the laypersons. Although the current prefect of the Dicastery of Communication is not a member of the clergy, all other members of church leadership today are consecrated. The new constitution will open leadership position to lay women and men for the Dicastery, which will more or less replace congregations and pontifical councils. Secondly, there is a strong focus on local bishop conferences. Catholic News Agency has counted at least 50 times the mention of this term in the document. In general, the Constitution seeks to enhance the importance of local bishops' conferences and continental ones. This new focus on federalism is especially interesting in the light of the current developments in Germany. Bishops and other members of the synodal path there have recently voted on topics such as marriage, sexuality, and ordination, favoring a digression of current church teaching. However, the presenters of the new Constitution were quick to clarify that what is established by an Episcopal conference cannot contradict the universal magisterium. Otherwise, we are outside the ecclesial communion, they said at the presentation. And thirdly, two very important departments of church leadership will be united. The Congregation of Evangelization of the Peoples, formerly known as Propaganda Fide, and the Pontifical Council for Promoting the New Evangelization, hence the name of the document, Preach the Gospel. The Pope himself will preside over the newly formed Dicastery for Evangelization. This can be interpreted as a particular focus on outward-oriented evangelization, going towards the people. For anyone who wants to understand better what was changed and how, I recommend to read up on it on catholicnewsagency.com, where my colleague Courtney Maris put together a good overview on the changes. And Andreas, before I let you go, I understand uh, today is another Roman Knights event at the Vatican Bureau uh, that's hosting it. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure, Tracy. I'm, I'm here at the Palazzo Orsini, a few meters away from the Tiber River in the center of Rome, at the invitation of the Ambassador of the Order of Malta. We have a fantastic panel of speakers, including the Australian Ambassador, the Superior General of the Legionaries of Christ, and an Italian businessman who's also part of the Papal Foundation Centesimus Annus. 
we'll discuss the topic of leadership and the church. You see, this is very fitting with the new apostolic constitution we just discussed. The main questions for us will be, how do you become a good leader? What is good leadership? And what can we learn from the church about leadership? We'll have a summary of the evening in next week's Vaticano show and also the full discussion online on EWTN's social media channels. Well, Andreas, thank you so much for your time today and speaking with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Tracy. Our Ukraine's president says that he would welcome the Vatican's efforts to bring an end to the military conflict in his country. Following a phone conversation, Volodymyr Zelensky tweeted, quote, told his holiness about the difficult humanitarian situation and the blocking of rescue corridors by Russian troops. In addition to welcoming Vatican diplomacy, the Ukrainian president thanked the Holy Father for his prayers. Well, Germany says that it will not boycott energy from Russia. The country's chancellor adds economic sanctions imposed on Moscow are working, but for now, the military conflict continues. Our Ukraine says it has retaken an important suburb of Kyiv. The move might make it harder for Russian forces to surround the capital city. The Kremlin says Russian troops have nearly overtaken three other suburbs near the capital. Still, the Secretary General of the United Nations says that he believes the sides are close to being able to negotiate peace very soon. Well, tomorrow, President Joe Biden heads overseas to meet with allies and European leaders. He will attend an emergency NATO summit in Brussels, Belgium, before traveling on to Poland, which has taken in more than two million Ukrainian refugees. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, just hours before President Joe Biden heads off to Brussels, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan told reporters in the briefing room today that new sanctions are on the way for Russia and that the war in Ukraine will not end easily or rapidly. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan previews President Joe Biden's trip to Brussels. He will have the opportunity to coordinate on the next phase of military assistance to Ukraine. He will join our partners in imposing further sanctions on Russia. The president's arrival tomorrow comes in the midst of Europe's worst refugee crisis since World War II. More than three and a half million people have fled Ukraine since Russian soldiers marched in. Just last night, President Biden told business executives Russian President Vladimir Putin's back is against the wall and warned. And the more his back is against the wall, the greater the severity of the tactics he may employ. In the capital of Kyiv today, black smoke, explosions and bursts of gunfire. Ukraine says it retook a strategically important suburb. Pentagon Press Secretary John Kirby warned the war could escalate and broaden and emphasized prudence. So you're talking about a nuclear armed power and you're talking about a leader, Vladimir Putin, uh, who has talked openly and dangerously uh, using rhetoric uh, regarding nuclear weapons and, and weapons of mass destruction. Uh, there's nothing, to, you can't take that lightly. Meanwhile, the White House is continuing to defend President Biden's Supreme Court pick. Chief of Staff Ronald Klain wrote, watching Judge Jackson testify, it is clear why the president nominated her for the Supreme Court, and indeed why she was his very first appointment to any federal judicial post. But pro-life group Susan B. Anthony List earlier warned, we have no doubt she'll work with the most pro-abortion administration in history to enshrine abortion on demand nationwide in the law. And just before, moments before the White House press briefing today, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki tested positive for COVID-19. That's the second time she's tested positive for the illness. As a result, she will not be traveling with President Biden to Europe, and she will be working from home, she says. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Well, the State Department has expanded travel bans for Chinese officials who repress religious and ethnic minorities. The ban builds on visa restrictions enacted during the Trump administration. And joining us now to discuss is Gordon Chang, author of The Coming Collapse of China and the Great U.S.-China Tech War. Gordon, welcome back. Always so great to see you. Um, a lot I want to get to, but first I want to get your thoughts on that travel ban by the State Department. It's good that we're imposing enhanced travel bans, but we got to remember that this repression, this coercion of religion, it starts at the top. And so I'm not going to be impressed until we start imposing those bans on Xi Jinping, the Chinese ruler, and the members of the Politburo Standing Committee. That's the apex of political power. That's where all of this is coming from, Tracy. So we shouldn't just deal with minor or low-level officials. We should be going at those who are responsible for this. 
Yeah, and Gordon, as you know, a few days ago, President Biden and President Xi had a two-hour conversation uh, which was focused on Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Following that talk, the Chinese ambassador to the U.S. told Face the Nation that, quote, China's trusted relations with Russia, it's not a liability. Actually, it's an asset in the international efforts to solve the crisis in a peaceful way. China is part of the solution. It's not part of the problem. Uh, Gordon, your reaction to that? Well, China has been financing Putin's war on Ukraine with these elevated commodity purchases. We've seen China make its financial system available to sanctioned Russian institutions. Chinese diplomats are now working in service of the Kremlin. And China's propaganda machines are amplifying these ludicrous Russian notions um, that, that uh, Moscow is propagating. So it just seems to me that uh, we should be treating China as a combatant. And, and clearly what Qin Gong, the ambassador to the U.S., said, uh, we should just ignore that. Yeah. Uh, speaking of that conversation between Biden and Xi, it was very lengthy, uh, two hours, yet the readout from the White House, that was rather short and concise. And while we don't know exactly what was said, um, Gordon, do you think that President Biden's words will have any sway over how China will act? I don't think so. I mean, we haven't seen changes in China's behavior. And, and remember, President Biden's talk with um, Xi Jinping, that followed that tense seven-hour discussion that National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan had with Yang Jiaxue, China's top diplomat in Rome. I mean, we're not getting anywhere, and we won't get anywhere until we start imposing sanctions on China, the same sanctions that we're imposing on Russia, because the two of them are acting together. And we have to give China some incentive to do the right thing, we're not doing that by just issuing warnings, which we fail to follow up on. Yeah, another thing I want to touch on is uh, the Biden administration uh, has tapped former Trump officials to help pass the China competition bill. Um, I want to get your thoughts on that. And do you think it may help push this bill through? Well, yes, because there are certain bipartisan elements to this bill, especially the um, um, building up our semiconductor capacity and also putting some resiliency into supply chains. We need to bring our factories back, and that will also have support across the aisle. So that's good. Now, there are some parts of this China competition bill which have very little to do with China, and that's where the sticking point has been. Um, but clearly, um, on those elements which have broad support across U.S. society, I'm very happy that Trump officials are supporting this effort. And, Gore, not a whole lot of time left, but wondering uh, what else you're following right now. What do you have your eye on? I'm going to be looking at um, basically Beijing's um, response to Russia over the next week or so. We have seen indications that uh, China is supplying military information to Russia to target, for instance, Ukrainian drone operators. If this continues, I think that we have a clear indication that these two are working together. So those little things, uh, which are actually in the open source, are really important to tell us where this is going. All right. We're going to leave it right there, Gordon. Thank you so much. I always appreciate your analysis. Thank you, Tracy. Coming up, President Biden's Supreme Court nominee faces questions from lawmakers. Plus, Congress considers ways to help the United States compete with China. On Capitol Hill, U.S. lawmakers are preparing to take up a bill designed to improve America's competitiveness with China, specifically semiconductor manufacturing and scientific research. Democrats say it'll be a shot in the arm for American business. That's going to further improve our supply chain, bring back manufacturing to our shores, invigorate um, our semiconductor production, which is not only great for jobs, it is great for lowering costs. But Republican Congressman Rodney Davis tells EWT at News Nightly the bill creates barriers instead. A lot of the provisions that the House added to it were restrictions that, that would actually take back some of the some of, of what the ideas of the Competes Act would, would put into place to make it easier for America to be put first. Republican Senator Rick Scott, long critical of China's human rights policies, compares the bill to doing business with Russia. So when I think about what we should be doing with regard to Communist China, will this bill make them more accountable for their bad deeds and will it put American businesses in better shape? Just throwing money at a program doesn't make it better. 
Senate Republican Whip John Thune tells EWTN News Nightly the House version is loaded with poison pills. The Senate bill is the bill that should pass. The House added a whole bunch of stuff to it, loaded it up with all kinds of unrelated things. They imported their climate agenda, their green energy agenda into that bill, which is not what that bill's about. Senator Thune adds that a final version may take several weeks to hammer out before lawmakers can vote on it. And during today's hearings for Supreme Court nominee Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, Senator Lindsey Graham asked a blunt hypothetical question, quote, could you fairly judge a Catholic? He was recalling Senator Dianne Feinstein's criticism of then nominee Amy Coney Barrett for her Catholic faith in 2017. How would you feel if somebody up here on our side said, you know, you attend church too much for me or your faith is a little bit different to me? and they would suggest that it would affect your decision. Would you find that offensive? Senator, I'm... I'm... I would if I were you. Well, later, Senator Graham walked out when Chairman Dick Durbin attempted to defend the judge's criticisms of U.S. detainee policy at Guantanamo Bay. On the issue of life, Judge Brown Jackson affirmed the high court's decisions which legalized abortion. Roe and Casey are the settled law of the Supreme Court concerning the right to terminate a woman's pregnancy. During his questioning, Senator John Cornyn challenged Judge Brown Jackson about issues of traditional marriage and religious freedom. Our West Virginia's Governor Jim Justice says the state's new pro-life law will show respect to the Down syndrome community. He has signed the Unborn Child with a Disability Protection and Education Act, which prohibits mothers from aborting babies because they have Down syndrome. The World Health Organization has issued new guidelines on abortion, which treat pro-life objections as an obstacle while also ignoring the right to life. The pro-life director of ADF International is criticizing the new guidelines, which are opposed in principle to Catholic teaching. A day after the crash of a China Eastern Airlines flight, no survivors have been found among the 132 people aboard. China's state television has shown search and rescue workers at the crash site, which is labeled with evidence markers. Local villagers were first to arrive at the scene. Hundreds of rescue workers have also responded from neighboring provinces. Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte is endorsing Ferdinand Marcos Jr. in the country's upcoming elections. <laughs> Known as Bong Bong, Marcos is the son of the former dictator. Three other candidates are Manila's mayor, the former national police chief, and former boxing star Manny Pacquiao. Up next, how one woman leaned on her Catholic faith following the death of her husband. Plus, the Vatican has released the Holy Father's schedule for Holy Week. March is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month, and according to the Colorectal Cancer Alliance, more than 151,000 people will be diagnosed with the disease this year, and more than 52,000 will die from it. The fight with CRC is one that Catholic mom Christy McDonald knows all too well. Her husband, Jamie Samuelson, a Detroit sports writer and radio host, lost his battle to colorectal cancer at the age of 48, leaving behind Christy and their three children. And now Christy is raising awareness and advocating for colorectal screenings on her husband's behalf. And joining me now is Christy McDonald, a media personality from Michigan. Christy, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your story. And first off, we are so sorry for your loss. Thanks so much, Tracy. It is really good to be with you and be able to continue to spread the message. Well, great to have you. And Christy, if you don't mind, um, can you tell us what it was like when your husband first found out about his diagnosis? Well, it was shocking at first because we were under the age of 50 and everything we had heard about colon cancer or colonoscopies was wait until after you're 50 and then get checked out and I'm sure everything will be okay. Um, he just had one bout over the weekend um, in December of 2018, what we thought was food poisoning. And um, it turned out when he had a colonoscopy a month later, that was not the case. He was diagnosed with colorectal cancer and it had already spread 
And what was so unbelievable, the more and more we started to learn about colorectal cancer, is that when younger people are getting it, because it's not on our radar, it's already at these advanced stages. So when we found out he had cancer, um, you know, our whole world changed and everything, all the plans that you make and the things that you think you'll be able to do in your life, all of a sudden stops and you have to reevaluate. Um, but for Jamie, he was a tough guy and he said, well, I'm going to take each day and we are going to live moving through each day. And if I'm here today, that's good enough for me. And we'll just keep plowing forward. And that's what he did um, until he died 19 months later. Mm. Christy, can you talk about you know, I know it must have been such a such a really hard time for you and the kids. Can you talk about how your faith helped to get you through it all? Yeah, you know, I was raised Catholic and um, go to church and um, brought my children into the church as well. And I used to sing in my church choir and um, faith is very important to us. But I think every Catholic out there can understand that when something like this happens, your faith is shaken and you have questions to say why. Why us? How did this happen? And at the same time that you ask those questions, you also say to God, walk with me, be with me, because that's sometimes all that you can just say is, I'm going to give it up to God today. Um, so we leaned on our community and um, we prayed and, you know, we lost Jamie, but um, my kids and I, we still remain steadfast and that there's faith and that there's hope and there's love in the world. And even when something like this happens to your family, the fact that we have that net and that community and our faith um, is what helps walk us through what is really a difficult journey still every day, even though he's been gone a year and a half, grief doesn't end, it just changes. And um, we navigate that every day. Yeah, and, and you're you're taking this and you're doing something positive with it, uh, with your advocacy. I understand that you have a social media series that's uh, up this month to continue that work. Um, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, Tracy, I'm a journalist just like you, and um, we know the power of information and we know the power of knowledge. And I was thinking um, this year, what could we do to really mark Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month? And I thought doing a series of interviews that I could put on social media so we hear from patients we also hear from doctors about getting a colonoscopy because they did lower the age to 45 this year. So it's very important to get that word out. We also talk to people who work with advocacy groups that when people do have colon cancer and their caregivers, where do they turn? What kind of support do they get? And then also talking to the oncologists, the ones who are on the front lines, and also the ones who are doing the research right now and trying to find out why is this happening to younger and younger people? So if we can continue to have Jamie's story out there, and continue to advocate in his name and his memory, but make it so that there's more awareness that another family doesn't have to walk this road or they can get themselves in with their doctor. And even people who are not 45 yet, I would urge you just to have that conversation with your primary care physician. Go in and say, hey, I know I'm not old enough yet, but what's our plan? Um, what should I be watching out for? If there's any signs or symptoms with my bowel habits or any something any you know different that I should be looking out for. And then also, I would also tell people, you know, know your family history. Um, talk to your family members. If there is a family history of any kind of cancer, it's always good to know that and, and just arm yourself with as much information as possible. I know that if the, the screening age were 45, I know Jamie would have gone right in there because he was that kind of guy we we really appreciated our health and we didn't take it for granted. Um, so if we can spread that awareness now and I can put that out there on my social media, my YouTube page, and if one person hears it, they pass it along to two other people, I think we can really start to to make a difference in things. Absolutely. And Christy, we have probably about 30 seconds left. So quickly, if you don't mind, tell us uh, where people can find you on social media and also any final thoughts. Please find me on Facebook at Christy McDonald, also on Twitter at Christy TV and Christy McD on Instagram, also Christy McDonald on YouTube. You can find all the information there. I would have to say, um, you know, the support that we get from people, if there are people grieving in your life, scoop them up and support them. Also value your health every day that you wake up and you're able to step forward, value that and, and move forward and always faith. There's always faith in this world, no matter how tough the road gets. And um, that's what we lean on every day. Well, Christy, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us, and God bless you. We're praying for you and your family. Thanks, Tracy. We'll take the prayers. And finally tonight, the Vatican has released the Holy Week schedule for Pope Francis, and it looks a lot like his itinerary.
from before the pandemic. On Good Friday, the Holy Father will do stations of the cross from the Colosseum for the first time since 2019. Pope Francis also will celebrate the Easter Vigil in St. Peter's Basilica and the Easter Sunday Mass in St. Peter's Square, which will hold large liturgical celebrations for the first time in three years. Easter Sunday, of course, is April 17th. But then we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.